when you say preaching Christ's words, many preachers aren't preaching Christ at all. And they're not preaching Christ's true, wor true words. There's all kinds of false gospels, false Bibles. And that's why, if, if they're even preaching any of it, the Bible, they're preaching from the false views and it's a terrible situation indeed. Uh, in Hebrews 2, verse 18, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, is able to succor or help them that are tempted. He can help us. He suffered himself, not for his own sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And that universal. Is there some something I can help you with, people? No, I have to leave the room, and I'm supposed to man this uh, thing, and I and I don't know what I'm doing. Well, may I continue preaching? Yes. I'm Thank sorry. you. And so the Lord's suffering, and a lot of people think it's, He suffered only for the elect. Absolute heresy. He suffered for every man, woman, and child that ever lived and ever will okay. live from now on. That's universal suffering for us. Not universalism, but the provision was made for every soul that ever lived to be saved if they would trust the Lord Jesus. As you say, provision is not possession. Provision is okay if you want it. You've got to accept the Savior as yours. And in Hebrews 2.18, And that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he's able to succor or help them that are tempted or tested. He can help us. He knows what temptation is. In Hebrews 5, verse 8, And though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Learned obedience. Obedience to the Father. The Father's will, no matter what it is, he was obedient to God the Father. In Hebrews 13, and verse 12, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people, set them apart, make them holy, with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Uh, the gate was a city wall, suffered without the gate. He means outside of Jerusalem. It wasn't inside Jerusalem, it was outside. They didn't want to have that death inside the city. They just put him way out without the gate, without the beginning of that city. And to sanctify and to set apart those that trust him. Then First Peter 3 in verse 18. Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Not like the Roman Catholic Church, the Mass pretending to be like Christ dying every single time the Mass is, is, is used. And you know that's every Sunday all over the world. But the scripture is clear. He suffered only once for sins. The cross of God. The just for the unjust. We're the unjust and he's the just. That he might bring us to God. He could bring us to God by genuinely faith, having faith in him. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened, made alive, by the Spirit. And the Lord Jesus was just that perfect man suffering for the sins of the world. Let's read verse number two together. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but the will of God. Now, he suffered once that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh. When he died, the Lord took him to heaven and he was taken up in after his death, resurrected bodily and taken to glory. Not the rest of he came here as an example for those that are in the flesh, those that are persons. And that's how he could be, have the feelings of everyone that was in the flesh. I see, he was perfect. The rest of us are not perfect. It was important to the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit that he be incarnated as a human being, but yet sinless, perfect God and perfect man. No longer suffer the rest of life, but it's the will of God. So he was taken to glory, and he's there at the right hand of God now as our Savior. Let's read verse number three together. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Lord Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, revelings, negligence, and abominable idolatry. Notice those six sins. Time passed. Now some people don't want to make anything pass. They want to continue living in all these six wicked sins. 
even after they're saved, many of them, uh, they don't walk according to the Spirit, but according to their own flesh. And, but in this particular situation, the, the time past of our life may suffice us. And these things that people, some people aren't sufficed. <coughs> Not the will of the Gentiles, the heathen. They have their ways, their false ways, their heathen ways. We should not walk after the heathen. We should walk after the Bible, the will of God. Uh, the will of the Gentiles. Uh, and then uh, when we walked in lasciviousness, lust and sinful temptation, wickedness, and lusts, the lust of the flesh, all kinds of sinful lusts and desires, even after being saved. Some do not have any... Uh, problem by continuing their sins, walking accordingly. Excessive wine. We should not drink the wine in any way even before we're saved, but many people are saved after they're drunkards or drinking at least the wine, and after they're saved, some of them continue. They still claim they're genuine Christians. I don't know. God should be the director of their lives, not wine of any kind, whatever kind of wine it is, or alcohol. Revelings. That means having all kinds of sexual activities with different people, reveling in some other ways, whether the dancing or whatever things would be part of that reveling. Uh, banquetings, having big sagas and things to do to, to, to eat and be together and uh, banquetings that are not always proper banquetings, but improper. And the sixth thing that we lived in a time past, abominable idolatries. Worshipping things that are not God, worshipping idol, idols, things like that. This is a terrible thing. Now, one thing that I said about this, it says in time past, may it be time past for all six of these sins, but keep the times past, past. That's what I've written down. Keep the times past, what you were, whether these six things are even more or less, keep them past. You don't have to continue them in the present. Live for the Lord Jesus Christ and our wickedness. In Galatians 1.13, you have heard of my conversation in time past. Paul said, you know what it was. Uh, I imprisoned Christians. I was with them when they were killed. I urged people to kill them. He was at the uh, stoning of Stephen, the first martyr. They, they put the clothes right at his feet. He was a the lead heresy, the lead Pharisee at that terrible thing. Keep the times back. You've heard my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. And the lust of the past of our life may suffice us. Keep it past. In Ephesians 2 and verse 2. We're in in time past again. Another verse on time past. You, you at Ephesus walked according to the course of this world. The world is a wicked world, and it's more wicked now than it was 20, 30, 40, 60, 100 years ago. Uh, what, what end? There's no end to it. How more wicked can it be? Corrupt in every way, way shape, and form. Uh, the sin of, for instance, the homosexuality, that's rampant now, it's running its life past and continuing present and in the future. You can't say anything against it. In fact, uh, President Trump went to the big uh, observation of homosexual uh, sin and wickedness, and he's all for it. He's not going to put anything against it. Uh, he's not biblical in that sense and many other senses of the world. But time passed. Walk, you walked according to the course of this world. What other world says, do. That's the way in time passed. Keep it fast, this church at Ephesus. Now, who was leading them in time past? Uh, according to the prince of the, the world of the air, the prince of the power of the air. That's the dev devil himself. Uh, this is what these Ephesians were doing. The spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The evil spirit, satanic spirit. And that's what the life was in Ephesus before they were saved as is keep in times past, past. Don't continue it. Don't uh, re continue doing what you're doing. That was bad. Then in 1 Peter 2 and verse 10, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. They've changed. 
keep it changed, forget the past, stay out of the past again, which are now have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. They're walking for the, with the Lord and doing what He wants them to do. Let's read verse number four together. Wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them the same excessive ride, speaking evil of you. So as this verse is, those people that are lost and unsaved, or even saved Christians that are not like the Lord, they think it's strange. And if we walk not with the Lord, uh, they think it's strange that you run not with them. Continuous action, continuous, he continues to think it's strange. That's another present tense. Uh, the, the lost people continue to think it's strange and continue to think you don't continue to run with them. Now, some Christians, or nominal Christians at least, run with the world many times. Some of them drink, some of them uh, use foul language. It's a horrible thing. They should not run with the world and not continually run with the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. The world should not own us. We should not be obedient to the world or the things of the world. Uh, strange you run out with them, the same excess of riot. And because you don't run with the world, speaking evil of you. A continuous, present tense action again, continually. They call us crazy, they call us nuts, they call us something, but they think we should run with them. If we don't, they speak speaking evil of us. They're the evil ones, but they don't know what's evil and what's good. They, they speak evil of those that are strong, strong for the Lord. It's entirely a wicked the way this is, but uh, sometimes being spoken evil of is good. It's a testimony that they don't like those that stand for the truth and for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read verse number five together. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? All those that are running evilly and lost, they were going to be give account one day to him, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is ready to judge. Now, that ready is also present, they're continuously ready to judge, and he's the judge that God has given to be the judge. God the Father appointed the Lord Jesus as the judge, to, of, and he's ready to do that, continuously ready to judge two kinds of people, the quick and the, and the second one is the dead. That word quick is a present tense, that are living, continuously living, quick means living. And then the dead, they are lost and bound for hell. Now, all of us human beings will give an account of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a judge both of the living, genuinely saved people, and the dead, those that are lost and bound for hell. The judge of both. One is going to be at the judgment seat of Christ for the Christians, the other at the great white throne judgment for the lost. So, first of all, <coughs> judging the living and the dead. In John 5, verse 22, for example, the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. It's interesting. He is the judge, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that they rejected, and they're, they're certainly lost and bound for hell. In 2 Corinthians 5, and verse 10, for we, that as the saved ones, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and everyone may receive the things done in the flesh according to that he has done, whether good or bad. So the judge of the, of the lost will be at the great white throne. The judge of the saved, the Christians, will also want to be judged, but will be done for the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ. And then in Revelation 20, verse 11, 2011, well, I don't think we read 2 Corinthians 5.10, did we read that? Yeah, we did. Yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, we'll move on to Revelation 20, verse 11. At the great white throne. And I saw a great white throne, and in the side of it, the Lord Jesus Christ, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Heaven and earth just, just disappeared. And I saw the dead, those that are lost, bound for hell. Small and great. Some dead are small, some dead are great, I mean important and less important. Uh, stand before God. All these people that have heard the gospel, 
and rejected the gospel, they're going to have to stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. Those are for people who are genuinely saved. We're in the book of life. And the dead, the lost, were judged out of these things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The book of life has all the names of those who are genuinely saved. If we're out of that book, we'd be cast into hell. It's a very important book. And the Lord Jesus is the judge who will judge the quick or living, judge the seed of Christ, the dead, the great white throne judgment. He will judge righteous judgment, and it will be not just, I guess, like some judges today. Some judges today, one or two things could be wrong with them. Number one, they don't have all the facts. Number two, having all the facts make a faulty judgment, but not the Lord Jesus Christ. He definitely has all the facts as omnipotent and omniscient, uh, but he makes always righteous judgment. Let's read verse number six together. For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in spirit. Now, the need to preach the gospel. The gospel is preached. I have a total of uh, 14 verses on preaching the gospel. That's why I call the message what I call it. Christ preaching the true word, the true Bible, the need to preach the gospel. In Acts 16 and verse 10, after he had seen the vision, that is the apostle, and immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Are these people in Macedonia, they were lost, bound for hell, and Paul was called to preach the gospel to them. Then in Romans 1, in verse 15, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. The gospel, the good news, is prefaced by the bad news. All are sinners and bound for hell. And the gospel is the Christ himself, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is a savior of those who trust him and accept him and believe in him. And without that, Hell is the destiny and the destination. I'm ready to preach the gospel to you. Then Romans 1.16, we know that, know that one, I say it again. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. Notice, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Provision is made for everyone, as we've said many times before. Every sinner on earth, men, women, child, children, the provision is made, now would you trust Christ yourself and avail yourself of that provision to be saved and have eternal life. We've illustrated many times before, I can offer or provide for you if I had it and hold up to you a million dollars, offer it to everyone in this room, take it, if nobody comes up and takes it, it's been offered, provided, even though I don't have a million dollars, if I had, but you'd not receive it just because something's offered. We must accept it and receive it. Christ offers us eternal life. We must accept that and receive it. Then in uh, that's Romans one sixteen. Uh, then Romans ten and verse fifteen. Again on the gospel. And how shall they preach except they be sent? You've got to be sent by the Lord to preach his word. You've got to be sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Therefore, we have peace through our Lord, justified by faith. We have peace and bring glad tidings of good things. God says, how beautiful are the feet, those that walk and talk and that preach the gospel of Christ. And in Romans 15, 19, and 21, 
though mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God through mighty signs that from Jerusalem and round about into Eurythium, Eurythium I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. What Paul says is faithful in those areas. Elect, elect, uh, Eurythium, boy, it's a hard one. It's a funny one. I have fully preached. Uh, yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named. He doesn't want to repeat himself. If somebody's preaching the gospel, he goes to another city. And Paul was faithful. And lest I should build upon another man's foundation. But as it is written, again it says, as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. And they that have not heard shall understand. And that's why it's so important that we continue the ministry of the internet and to the internet. Pastor Dan is skilled in that. He, he brought it to our church. And through that church, when I read there about the outreach of the, our church and the internet, amazing how many thousand listen to us, uh, download this, various things. We praise the Lord for this. And people that are not on the internet, just what they have, some of them have big churches, uh, but no internet ministry. Uh, but they must be faithful to preach Christ no matter what. And then uh, in Romans 15 and verse 28 29, and I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. A lot of people, when they hear the gospel, it starts out with, dear sinners, and you're, you're lost, you're bound for hell. That isn't a blessing to them. It says, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel, to be redeemed. When I was 16, 17, I guess it was, and heard the gospel for the first time, I was a Methodist, went to the Methodist church. My mom told me I got to go as a son. That's what mom's supposed to do. And young children, they should obey, and I did. She gave me a choice, either the regular to the church services, which I attended once or twice. I was such a I look back at such a modernist preacher, didn't say that the Bible is talking just about general things. Either go to the morning service, they didn't have an evening service, or to Sunday school. I chose Sunday school. I went a couple times to the morning service, couldn't stand it. Uh, so I went to Sunday school. And we heard the scriptures, he taught the scriptures. He wasn't as clear as he could have been, but he's an older man, Mr. Oakley is his name. and. Uh, he was an alternative. Later on in life, I found he was saved. He was saved. He taught Sunday school, but he didn't make it clear what salvation was to us young people. But uh, come the blessings of the gospel of Christ. But Uncle Charlie, who was a caretaker of our school, Uncle Charles Allen, did bring the gospel clearly and straight to me. And down in his boiler, boiler room, he told me about the fires of hell. I could feel the heat. I knew exactly what that was. He gave me the gospel of Christ, and it was a blessed gospel. Didn't hear it in the church. In fact, after I was saved, my mother didn't like me going to another church to preach the gospel. It's the same church that my wife went to. And uh, she, she hired a preacher, Pastor Manton, I guess was his name. And uh, she said, take my son out and see if you can, you know, Help him change what do something. He, I argued that. Because he was telling me things that were not gospel, not truth. But the blessings of the gospel of Christ. She should have been thankful that her son had been saved by the grace of God through Christ. And not to cry out against Uncle Charles Allen who led me to the Lord. Blessings of the gospel. Then first Corinthians one, verse seventeen. For Christ sent me not to baptize. He wasn't a baptizer. A lot of people baptized for people to be saved by water baptism. That's not scriptural. Well, for first baptism after we've been saved. But called, Paul was not called to baptize. He did occasionally. But to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words. Not with wisdom of words. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Some preachers with words talk about things. But never 
bring out the cross of Christ and the Savior that died on that cross for their sins. And we'll make it clear. For the preaching of the cross, we know this, let me say it again. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved is the power of God. Preaching of the cross. They say, what all is that about? So it's terrible. But we're, it's God's power to those of us who are saved. And then in 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 4, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which you also have received. Now it's important that we not just hear it, but we receive it. The lost need to receive the gospel. And wherein ye stand, receive it and stand therein. Don't waffle and change and drift like many people do. It's true you should conserve and not move on from what is true and truth. I declare the gospel which I preach unto you wherein ye receive, wherein ye stand, for which also ye are saved. The gospel, we should stand for the gospel, exactly what it is. Christ died for the sins of the world and rose again and offered salvation for those that believe. Not only just to receive and to stand, but also keep in memory what I preach unto you. Keep in memory, don't lose it, don't forget it. Uh, be wise about it, tell it to others. Unless ye have believed in vain. That's a sad situation when you believe in vain. You say, I believe, but it wasn't sincere, it was in vain. It was foolish, uh, and that's so many people. Uh, a lot of people go and visit different homes, different cities, different places. They come back and they say, I led 15 to the Lord. Some of those very well may have been in vain, believe me. I know I visited a house as a pastor first, I think, back in Newton, Massachusetts. And uh, this man he gave the gospel to me. He said he believes and so on. But it was in vain. He never came to church, never did anything about it. Uh, so it's easy. You want to get me out of the house, I guess. You didn't want to be bothered with a preacher talking to him about the Bible, about the Bible, about Christ. Lest you have believed in vain. <coughs> Too many say yes to Christ, but it's in vain. Uh, God says, I read the heart. You don't believe this in vain and forget the thing. Uh, preach in vain. No. Lest it should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Unto us which are saved, the power of God. God's power to save. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. Though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. He's not going to boast us. For necessity is laid upon me. A woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He was called by the Lord Jesus Christ when he was a sinner. He rode to Damascus, ready to imprison, probably slay some of the Christians. And he never wavered from that salvation, that trust. And he, he went to preach, he declared the gospel by preaching to what you have received and when you sang, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach in and don't change it unless you believe in vain. And many times people believe in vain and nothing to it, don't agree with it, something different. And how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture. He died for the sins of all of us. And that also he was buried, the burial of Christ. And that he rose again the third day, according to the scripture. That's the gospel. That's the truth. He died for the sins of the world, that we must trust in him. In 2 Corinthians, let's see, if the God, now, if the, if this 2 Corinthians, verse, verse 4, if the gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds. The God of this world, that's Satan. Satan and his fatherhood and his kingdom wants to stay as it is and increase and grow. And everyone that's not in the kingdom of Christ, the Lord Jesus, by trusting him as Savior, is, the, is in the kingdom of Satan. They don't want to admit that. They don't agree with that. The choice is ours. In whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Minds, blind minds, 
lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan doesn't want anybody to leave his kingdom. We're born in his kingdom until we save our Savior and trust Christ as our Savior and get into God's kingdom. The kingdom of God was still Satan's kingdom. He wants to keep everyone in that kingdom with him, the God of this world. And that's the image of God, the gospel of Christ, the glorious image of God, and the gospel of Christ will shine unto them. He blinds their minds and blinds their eyes. In 2 Corinthians 10, verse 16, to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in any other man's line of things made ready to your hand. It is why I just come along here and not preach the gospel of truth. Some people are made ready, some things are made ready to our hand. Then in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, For he that cometh preaches another Jesus, whom we will not preach. Uh, to preach another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. Not the Lord Jesus Christ, not perfect God, perfect man, not the Savior, not the, died, the one who died on the cross bring, bring the sins of the world, not one that was buried and then rose again bodily, and then went ascended into heaven. Some preachers today, you know that, modern apostate preachers, lost, bound for hell, preach another Jesus. And that's a sad sin because they're fooling a lot of people that attend their church. They think the preacher's got to preach truth, and if they preach another Jesus, he's a nice man, and he's this and he's that, but not the eternal Son of God. Not deity. They shirk at deity. Uh, whom we have not preached. These people are preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached. He preaches straight, Paul does. Or if you receive another spirit instead of the Holy Spirit, instead of trusting Christ and receiving me to the Holy Spirit, but maybe an evil spirit. That's a false one. Which ye have not received. Ye, ye who are saved, not received. He's preaching preach another spirit. Or another gospel. We've said that many times. There's so, there's so many gospels in these modernistic, liberal, apostate churches. Where do they get this other gospel? In the schools they go to, and other places, and for their, from their friends, other preachers. Uh, but they don't get it from the Bible, this other gospel. And the people who listen to that other gospel, one of the gospels is universalism. Everybody that ever lived, is saved, born again, and will go to heaven. See? Sounds great. That's another gospel. The gospel says those that don't trust Christ are lost, bound for hell in the lake of fire. People don't like to hear that. It's bad talk. But they're preaching another gospel, makes them more money, and the people that are millionaires continue to attend their church, don't preach anything about that they believe, just talk general terms. Another gospel that you've not accepted. And that you might bear with him. That's why they preach another gospel. That the ones who are the hearers might bear with these false preachers and say good things about them. Then Galatians chapter 1, and verse 6 through 9. Paul says, I am marvel. I see you so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. It's horrible. Paul preached to them in Galatians. He wanted to trust the Lord and be, and be saved. Another God, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Gospel perversion, gospel perverters, changing. Not that everybody is a sinner, not that people that don't trust Christ will go to hell. Another gospel, which they have another gospel, some that trouble you would pervert the gospel. But he says, but in Galatians 1, 6 to 9, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. A curse bound for hell, the curse of God upon him. That's strong language. Let him be accursed. As we said before, he repeats himself. He wants to be clear. So saying, now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, 
Let him be accursed. A curse from God, a curse from eternity. It's a sad situation. <coughs> sad boy. All apostate preachers are accursed. If you tell them that, this is what the Bible says. If you preach any other gospel, they're accursed. Well, they wouldn't like to be called a curse, would they? That's what God calls them. And then in Ephesians 1, verse 12 and 13, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted Christ, in whom he also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after ye believed and were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So these Ephesians trusted Christ and believed in him and were, were sealed by the Spirit of God. Then in Philippians 1 and verse 7, a lot of verses on the gospel, the inner scriptures. In Philippians 1 verse 7, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, as much as both in my bonds, he was in prison in Rome and my wrote Philippians, both in my bonds and the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you're all partakers of my grace. Notice those two areas of the gospel, defense and confirmation. You defend it and confirm it, and these are these are important things. You defend it, say it's right, then you confirm it and preach that gospel. <coughs> then in First Thessalonians 1 and verse 4, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Put in trust. God saved him, blinded him, in the road to Damascus to imprison Christians, and he was, he was trusted that gospel. Christ himself put Paul in the gospel of trust. Uh, even so we speak. How does he speak? Negatively? Not as pleasing men, but God. When you speak pleasing God, sometimes men get very angry at you, dislike you, think you're a little bit weird. But pleasing God which trieth our hearts, and God does test and try our hearts in me. And then in Second Thessalonians 1 verse 7, to you who are troubled, rest with us, those that are saved but troubled. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it is. You know not God, obey not the gospel, our Savior. Then verse 9. What's going to happen to these people who don't believe our, our, in our Savior's gospel? Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? That's just for you days, hours, or years. Everlasting destruction. From the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. It's a terrible judgment on those who reject the gospel of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. It's in the Bible. A lot of these preachers don't believe that. I don't believe there's any such thing as hell or fires of hell, or lake of fire. Let's read verse number, number seven. Yeah. But the end of all things is at hand. He is therefore sober and watch under prayer. The end of all things. Now, the end hasn't come yet, but it is certainly sooner than a million years or a thousand years. The end of all things. Therefore, be first of all sober, not giddy and laughing all the time and uh, hurrah! Be thoughtful and serious-minded. That's a lot of words. There are a lot of terms that sober, sober, sober means. Very important. Be conscious and not just raving and raving. Secondly, watch into prayer. Don't forget the prayer life. If you're genuinely saved, you can pray to the Lord. Watch into prayer. That means. Look after it, don't just do flippancy in prayer, but be careful to observe things that you're praying about and watch under prayer. Let's read verse number 8 together. Yeah. Above all things, a fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of your sins. Now that's how fervent charity is in the present Greek tense, continuously 
perpetrate our love among yourselves as Christian believers, though we may differ in doctrines here and there. I'm talking about general Christians all around the world. Uh, we trust it in a local church. Our doctrine statement is there. We agree with that. But there may be some Christians that are genuinely saved. They may be Armenians. Believe you can lose your salvation. We don't agree with that. But we have fervent love or charity toward all of them that say we're going to meet them in heaven, even though we have doctrinal differences down on earth. And we should have love toward them regardless. We don't have to fellowship with them. We don't have to go have services with them and join them in worship. We can have fervent love. Doesn't say join the same church and so on and so. But fervent love among yourselves. Now, among yourselves would be the genuine believers, those that are genuinely saved, and uh, whatever their doctrines may be. But if we're doctrinally the same, similar in doctrines, we should have even more than fervent love. We're continuous fervent love and truth. For charity or love shall cover a multitude of sins. We don't look so hard at sins. We have love and charity for those that are born again and saved. But whatever their doctrines may be, we disagree with their doctrines. Then in verse number nine, let's read verse number nine again. Have you use hospitality, hospitality one to another, another not grudging. Hospitality. That's one of the things that's I asked my wife about before we had a church in our living room. I said, honey, what do you think? And she said, no, we wouldn't go. I wouldn't be in the church. We'd have our living room furniture here. No internet ministry, no ministry in our church home, but use hospitality one to another without grudging. In those days, they didn't have a lot of motels like we have today. And when those people wanted to come to a city, they were invited by genuine believers to come in their house and stay with them a few days, wherever it is. We're using hospitality for our son. I think he's our third son. He's coming tomorrow. He called me up and said, Dad, his name is Dick or Richard. He called me up and said, Dad, you still have room in your, in your house for visual? I said, absolutely. Third floor is a room. I said, uh, Moraine and I are thinking of coming to your house and have fellowship with you for a few days on this Monday. So that's fine that you come. Hospitality, without grudging. It would be good to see him. I'm sure Pastor Dan and his wife would be good to see him too. And Anna, all of them. They go out to eat, I'm sure, and fellowship with him in other ways. Let's read verse number 10. Yeah. As every man, uh, man, man receives the gift, even though so the minister is the same one to another, as good stewards, stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now the gift, whether it be of preaching, or the gift of uh, <clears throat> leading people to Christ, whether the gift of contest means, <clears throat> were to minister or to use or serve others with that gift. Now some people don't have any gifts. Well, apparently here, there's a gift that every man, as every man has received the gift, the gift of salvation perhaps, the gift of eternal life, minister the same. That's a present continuous action in the Greek. Continue, minister, and use it, and give it to other people, and the same one to another. Minister the same, whatever you do, minister that same gift, whatever it is, one to another. As good stewards, now, to be a receiver of something is one thing, be a steward, a good steward, to minister and to help others with that same gift. That's stewardship. And stewardship of the manifold grace of God. If you have a gift that you don't minister, <coughs> you're, you're, you're stopping the free use of that gift. God does not want that. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so, Peter, in this particular section of the scriptures tells us a number of, number of things. Among, among other things, he talks about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And giving that gospel, whosoever will trust Christ may be saved. It's an important part of his ministry, important part of Peter's ministry as well. And we should do that to those that are lost, those we know, those who are friends, those in our family, wherever it might be. They won't all receive that gospel. But we should 
be good minister of the gospel, tell it to them anyway, even if they laugh at us. But God is great. He wants to use every one of us to know the Lord, to serve him, to be a minister, not necessarily a preacher, but a servant. That's what a minister means, a servant that will serve the Savior. Let's close in word of prayer. Our God and Father, we do thank thee for Peter's letter, and we ask the Lord to guide us and direct us in the fulfillment and the profitability of that letter, following the scriptures that God has given to us. We love thy sa the Savior and love one another with fervent charity and acceptability and gladness <coughs> one with another in service, loving the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. In his name we ask and pray. Amen. Okay, let's take our last final hymn today, which is 318.